quite interactive. Yeah? So, uh -huh. yeah. uh, the other lectures typically they made a kind of 10 minute break, yeah. so that you can decide and I see th looking at their face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking about topological lattice model from gauging. OK, so I know that this is your fifth hour of lecture today, and you're a little bit tired, and this title sounds a little bit abstract. <laughs> I'll try to make it um, followable as possible. I'll try to do examples, very, very explicit examples, lattice model, which are exactly solvable, meaning that if you take down the nodes and you want to go home and reproduce all the, all the calculation, you can do that. Okay, and um, so, so, so the title, of course, contains two parts. One is uh, topological models, and the other is uh, gauging. So, well, we can have a full lecture on either topic, um, but for the lecture today, or for the, for the three lectures that I'm going to have, I want to put them together because these are very tightly connected subjects. And uh, understanding topological model from the perspective of gauging is one that I find particularly useful um, in, in my years of study. Okay, so I will try to explain to you through very simple examples how these two are related. Okay. Um, so I want to say something more about gauging. Okay. So gauging is something that is not very easy to explain because, well, first of all, the name is very confusing. Okay. The name gauge, when you read about it, you don't know what it means. And that is because of a lot of historical reasons why people studied this subject and how it evolved over the years. Um, but as condensed matter people, Sometimes we don't know about all the histories of where it comes from, like um, um, uh, uh, gravity and, uh, and all that. And actually, in a lot of cases, we don't need to go so much back into the history in order to understand it. So that's something I'll, I'll try to convey uh, through these lectures, that there's actually very simple ways to understand what gauging or what gauge theory means in a condensed matter setting. Okay, and in condensed matter setting, I mean we have local degrees of freedom, spins, bosons, electrons, and they couple to each other in a certain way. They might hop around, they have interactions, and they usually sit on a lattice. And then the goal uh, is we ask what is the ground state of the system? What are the excitations of the system? Things like that. Okay, completely in a condensed matter setting. Okay. Um, so, so the first reason is, uh, is that uh, the, the word is confusing, that gauging. So actually, when, whenever I see gauge or gauging, I just replace it by uh, local, or more explicitly, local symmetry or local constraint. Okay, so that is something I find very useful. Now, whenever I see the word gauge or gauging, I just, in my mind, I replace it by local symmetry. Okay, and then you will see that that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about, we'll be talking about lattice model with local symmetry. And somehow that, the, the, the fact that the model has local symmetry can give rise to a lot of exotic phenomena uh, as condensed matter faces. Okay, uh, so the second reason that gauging is, is uh, it's not a very easy subject, it's because the way that it's usually taught, well, the, the way I first tried to learn about it is in a quantum field theory class, and the teacher started writing down Lagrangian, and started writing down fermions coupled to the gauge field, and the gauge field transforming certain way, the fermion transforming certain way, and there's Lorentz invariance, and there's covariant der derivative, 
all of that, okay. So very, very soon into the lecture, the, the, the teacher was writing down like G nu nu and, and, and a lot of indices, upper indices, lower indices. So I will not do that, okay. I'll try to keep things very, very simple and even very naive to the extent that we can do exactly solver models and try to explain what a gauge theory is. Okay. So for those of you who already know a little bit or, or already know too much about the gauge theory, um, my version might look different or it might look too naive. And uh, I will comment upon how the, the version I'm talking about will be, is related to the usual version that people talk about. Okay, um, um, uh, things like quantum QED, that kind of thing. Okay, but that will be further back into the lecture because I want to just start from very, very simple examples and show you uh, what, what do we mean by gauge theory and why that's something that's non-trivial. Okay, so um, the first example that I'm going to talk about without explaining why I want to talk about it is, is the model called Toric code, okay. Uh, how many of you have heard about Toric code? Oh wow, good, okay. Um, and that's great because we're going to, I'm going to go over it, well, um, for the other half who hasn't seen Toric code, I'll, I'll still go over it in every detail and we will review all the properties of Toric code and try to see how to reinterpret it or how to interpret it in terms of a gauge theory. Okay. And then see how Toric code can emerge by gauging something, by taking another model and uh, apply the procedure called gauging and then reproduce Toric code. Okay. So uh, we'll see if we can get through that today. Okay. So, so the first part is, uh, Toric code and Z2 gauge theory. Z2 gauge theory. Okay. Toric code is a very popular model. It is taught in condensed matter classes. It is taught in quantum information classes because it, it's a, it's a, it's exactly solvable, so everyone can play around with it, and it encodes some very, very non-trivial properties. Okay. So usually, the simplest version of Toric code that I like to talk about is, someone, is one that sits on a two-dimensional square lattice. Okay. So on this two-dimensional regular square lattice, we have one qubit, or one spin one-half degree of freedom on every edge. Okay. So all the, all the edges contain a qubit. Uh, I'm just drawing a few of them. So with a qubit, of course, I'll label it as tau. I'll label the qubit as tau. And as a qubit, of course, it has a, a, a two-dimensional uh, poly operators, tau x and tau z. Okay, so these are the operators that act on the spin. So, of course, tau x and tau z, and the combination gives you tau y. All right, so this is a Hilbert space. And the Hamiltonian, it's a sum of terms, and some of the terms are centered around a vertex V, while the other terms are centered around the plaquette, which we call uh, P. Okay, so the Hamiltonian contains a bunch of terms. It's a sum over the kinds of terms that are centered around vertex, which I will call AV. And for the second type of term, they're centered around plaquettes, and I'll call them BP. Okay. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that. Uh, whenever you think I'm not making sense or you have any question, please just raise it to me, okay? I, I want to make sure that everyone's following. Okay, so the Hamiltonian contains the AV terms, the vertex terms, and plaquette terms, and and this is the vertex term. The vertex term involves four qubits. That's around the vertex, okay. And it's a tensor product of tau z operators around the vertex. Tau z, tau z, tau z, tau z. And that's it, okay. So we do a tensor product of four tau z, and that's our AV term. And secondly, we have these BP term, and this BP term is around the plaquette, 
And the tensor product of tau x term around the plaquette. So AB term is tensor product of 4 tau z, and BP term is a tensor product of 4 uh, tau x. And that's it. The Hamiltonian sums over all kinds of terms centered around all the vertices and all the plaquettes. And our, our goal is to find the ground state and, and properties of its excitation. Of course, this is a strongly interacting model. It, it involves spins. Um, and, uh, and the spins, they enter into these full body interactions. So at, on the surface, it looks very, very complicated. Uh, but what's nice about this model is that if you look at it, all the Hamiltonian terms, the AV and the BP term, they all commute with each other. Okay. So you can check that explicitly. So of course, all the, all the A terms commute with each other because they only involve tau z operator. Right? And tau z, wherever, whether they overlap or not, they always commute with each other. And similarly, all the B terms commute with each other because it involves only the tau x operator, and tau x operator always commute with each other. The only tricky part, the only thing that we need to check explicitly is whether the A term commute with B term. Okay. So if we have an A term here and a B term here, and they don't overlap, then we don't have to worry about it because the spin operators, when they don't overlap, they always commute. The only thing that's tricky is if we have, you see if we have a vertex here and a plaquette here, right? Then they overlap at certain locations, but rest assured that these terms, they still do commute because you can see that they overlap at exactly two locations, at this qubit and this qubit, right? So the tau z from the A term, they anti-commute with the tau x term from the, the B term, but they anti-commute at two locations. So the minus sign, you have two minus sign and add it together, these two terms commute with each other. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So, so these terms, Usually we don't have that in a condensed matter model, but this is a special model. This is a model where the terms, even though they overlap with each other, they commute with each other, meaning that they can have a complete set of eigenstates, including ground states, right? Whenever operators commute, they can have a com complete set of common eigenstates. So that means if we want to look for the ground state, we just f look for the ground state of each of the Hamiltonian terms. We can individually minimize energy for each of the term, and if we successfully minimize energy for all of the terms, we get the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So this is the nice thing about exactly solvable Hamiltonian, that all the ter Hamiltonian terms commute, and, um, and we can start looking for the lowest energy states by just looking at the local energy requirement without going for the global energy. Okay, so we can try to see how do we minimize energy for the A term and how do we minimize energy for the B term, right? And in the end, what we want is a ground state which minimizes energy for the A term and minimizes energy for the B term altogether. Okay. Well, the A term is a tensor product of four sigma z. And as a poly operator, it, what, what kind of eigenvalue does it have? What kind of eigenvalue does the A term have? Yes? Plus minus one, yes. Because it's, uh, it squares into one, it squares into identity. So the only possible eigenvalues are plus minus one. Okay? And same for the B term. The B term is a tensor product of tau x. And as a poly operator, it can only have eigenvalue plus minus one. And because I've, I have chosen to put a minus sign in front of all these terms, so the minimal energy state is the eigenstate with eigenvalue one for all the A operator and eigenvalue one for all the B operator. Right? That is something we're looking for. We're looking for a state that has eigenvalue one for all of these operators. Okay. Okay, we can try to see what that means. For example, if we want to have a wave function which has eigenvalue one for the A operator, that actually has a very nice physical interpretation. 
the A operator is in terms of these tau Z operators, right? And the tau Z, it has two eigenstates. Tau Z is equal to one on the zero state, and tau Z is equal to minus one on the one state. This is the two states of the spin one half. Okay. And to have a picture of what the ground state looks like, we're going to assign some physical meaning to this zero and one state, or to the tau z equal one and the minus one state. Okay. We're going to say that if the spin is in the state zero, then the particular edge is not occupied by a string, while on the other hand, if the spin is in the state one, then it is occupied by a string. Okay. You can imagine that in the state one, there's a, there's a color string. Let me find another color. Let's say we have blue color. So if it's in a state one, then we have a blue color running along the edge. While if, we have, if we're in a state zero, then there's no string running along the edge. Okay. This corresponds to no string. This corresponds to string. And this is very uh, intuitive because the qubits, they live on the edges. So it's very straightforward to interpret, it, to interpret the two different states of the qubit as the edge being occupied or not being occupied by a string. Of course, this is just, just, just another way to say that there are two states of the qubit. But then it gives a very nice interpretation of what this A, a, of this a term in the Hamiltonian wants. So the A term is a tensor product of all the tau Z operators. And remember that if we want to look for the ground state, we want the A term to be one. We want the A term to have an eigenvalue of one. But the A term involves a bunch of tau Zs, which means that we, we, we can only have an even number of tau Z in this term to be minus one. We can have all of them to be one. We can have all of them but two to be one and the other two to be minus one, that's fine. Or we can have all four of them be minus one, that's also okay. Right. So in order to satisfy the A term, the allowed configurations are like this. We can have a configuration where everything is not occupied. We can have a configuration where Two of the strings are occupied in blue. Or we can have the string going in different directions. We can go in, we can having them, we can have them go right through uh, the vertex. Or we can even have the configuration where all four edges are occupied by the string. Okay. And of course, there are uh, rotationally symmetric configurations of these ones, I'm not drawing them all, and, uh, but all of these kinds of configurations at a vertex are allowed by the AV term. So you can see that this gives us a very nice way to understand the requirement on the wave function imposed by A, because if we have no string, if we have two string, or if we have four string, the common property of all these configurations is that a string goes into a vertex and has to come out. Okay. For example, here, it goes into a vertex, it has to come out. This one goes in and come out vertically. And this one, you can think of it as one going horizontal and one going vertical, or two of them turning corners. But either way, a string cannot end. If we want to satisfy all the A terms, then at every vertex, the string cannot end. The string must go on. And the way for a string to go on is to form loops. Okay. For example, we can have configurations like this. We can have small loops going around a plaquette. This kind of configuration satisfy all the A terms. Or we can have bigger loops. We can have bigger loops that cover small area.
And that also satisfies all the A, A terms, right? Because the string never ends and forms a loop. Or we can have even more complicated shape of loops. And it twists around and, and wiggles. But in the end, as long as everything forms a loop, then we satisfy the A term. So we can have small loop, big loop, or multiple loops, but that's okay. As long as we have loops, we're fine with the A term. Okay. So the A term is saying that I want loops. So <laughs> any kind of loop is fine, but I only want loops. Okay. I don't want the strings to end anywhere. If the strings end anywhere, that's bad. That costs extra energy for the A terms. Okay. okay. So that's what the A term says. Yes. Right, so you can imagine that uh, we have one loop like this and another loop like that, and that's fine. Yeah, they just cross each other. Oh, if they share a bound, if they, like one loop like this and a small loop like that, if they share a bound, this bound gets removed, right? Yeah, so, so because uh, uh, you, you've, so to go from no string to string, you flip the spin, but if you flip it again, you go back to no string. This is a Z2 spin, so whenever two loops touch, they just cancel each other and become a bigger loop, which still satisfies the A term. Okay. Yeah, good question. Okay, so, so all these configurations are allowed, and, and they play a role in the gonna say wave function. Okay, um, all right, so next thing we want to look at what the B term is doing, right? If we only have the A term, if we only have the A term, all these configurations have minimal energy, meaning that they're all degenerate, right? If there's no B term, then there's no way to distinguish all these configurations from each other in terms of energy, and they, they, they generate a huge ground state degeneracy. And the huge ground state degeneracy will be removed once we add the B term. Okay. So now we can see what the B term does. The B term is a tensor product of four tau x around the plaquette, right? And if we apply the B term, what does it do? If we apply the B term to somewhere where there's no string, what does it do? It created a, a small loop, right? It generated a small loop like that. And if we keep applying, if we apply to another loop, if we apply to another plaquette, then it makes the loop bigger, right? So if we want to look for the ground state wave function, where BP acting on the ground state wave function should be equal to the wave function because we want the wave function to have eigenvalue one for the B operator, right? That's the way to minimize energy for the, for the B part. We want it to be an eigenstate of B with eigenvalue one. So we want to look for a wave function that satisfies this condition. And the way to do that, while still satisfying the A condition, is that we make a big superposition of all possible loop configuration. Okay, so let me try to draw, draw the picture. So a ground state wave function, if I want to draw the picture for it, let's say this is a two-dimensional system. We can have a configuration where there's no string. All the spins are in the state zero, right? And then we can have a state where there are small loops like that, and we can have a term where there's a small loop somewhere else, and we can have terms where there's a small loop, well, or there's a bigger loop, like that. Or we can have multiple loops. and so on and so forth, and we have to make a superposition 
of all the loop configurations all together, right? Remember, we mentioned that all the loop configuration, they satisfy the A term, and they, are, they all have minimal energy for the A term, but they will degenerate if we don't have the B term. Now with the B term, the B term split the degeneracy, but the B term map one loop configuration to another by flipping some plaquettes and, and the generating a loop or moving a loop or enlarge a loop, but it doesn't break the loop configuration, okay? It just maps from one loop configuration to another loop configuration. So if we want, if we want to satisfy all the B terms, the way to do it is to make a superposition of all possible loop configuration, and that will be our ground state wave function. Okay, does that make sense? And you can explicitly check that this wave function will be invariant under BP because what BP does is to create a, a small loop like that. It just map this part of the wave function to that part or map this part to that part. But in the end, the total wave function is invariant. So th this is why we say that the ground state wave function of the toric code Hamiltonian um, it's a condensation of loops. So pictorically, it's very easy to imagine uh, what is going on. But of course, this is a highly non-trivial wave function. Usually, we don't think about wave function this way. We think about spins polarizing certain directions. But this is a highly entangled ground state wave function, although in terms of this, uh, this loop configuration, it's easy to picture uh, what is happening in the wave function. Okay, is that clear? So it's, an, it's, a, it's a superposition and it's an equal weight superposition of all the loop configurations. We don't have a, any phase factor or any weight in front of the configurations. All the weights are equal. Uh, sorry, I, of course, I didn't, I didn't put in the normalization of the wave function. It should be properly normalized, but I'll just ignore it here. All right. Okay, so this is the, the wave function. But this is not all about wave function. If we imagine the situation on a more topological manifold, then the story can actually become different. That is, if we imagine the system to be living on a torus, Or another way to say it is that we consider periodic boundary condition between left and right and also up and down. Right. Imagine that we glue together the system between left and right and up and down. So make it into a torus. If we make it into a torus, that is, we're connecting left and right and up and down, there are actually configuration in the Hilbert space that also satisfy all the A term and all the B term, but doesn't look like this at all. Okay. So imagine a configuration where we just have one loop going across horizontally. So this is periodic boundary condition, so nothing is broken, even though it looks like it's broken, but actually it's connected back to this side. So everything is still closed loop. So it's still satisfied the A term, yes. Oh, for the minus one of BP? Yes, so you just, um, you just uh, change the, the sign structure here. For example, if you want this plaquette term to have an eigenvalue BP, then you just change plus sign to minus sign. And all the corresponding pairs, you make them having um, opposite signs, then BP will have eigenvalue minus one. Okay. So on the torus, this is a, this is a legitimate loop configuration, right? But it doesn't look like anything that we have drawn before. And you can imagine that there are others. 
For example, we can have one where we have a string going vertically. Or we can have one where we have both string in a horizontal way and string in the vertical way. These kind of configurations, they're still loop configurations, but we cannot start from the configuration where we have nothing, flip a little plaquette, and generate that. Right? If we flip little plaquette, we can only generate the loop, and that's what we call contractible. That, that it's like a bubble, and we can shrink it back to nothing. But these kind of loops, it's, it's a non-trivial loop on the torus, and you can move it, you can move it up and down. You can move it up and down, but there's no way to shrink it back to nothing, which means it cannot be generated by applying the BP operator uh, on any particular uh, loop configuration. So these are basically different universe for the ground states of the Tauric code on the torus. And you can see that there are four different universes. This is one, this is number two, this is number three, this is number four. And they give rise to four different sectors, four different dimensions of the ground state Hilbert space. This is the first dimension. The second dimension, we can start from this particular configuration and then add all the small loops. You can, you can do a superposition with configuration with one horizontal string and a small plaquette. We can do everything that we did for this no string configuration, and we make a big superposition of everything generated in that way so that it again satisfy all the BP terms while satisfying the AV terms, giving rise to a degenerate ground state of toric code on torus. Similarly, we can do the same thing for the configuration where we have a vertical string, right? We can start from the thing with just one single vertical string, and we can add little plaquettes, or we can add even little plaquettes on top of the string so that we, we move the string a little bit, but it still goes across the system. And we make a big superposition of all kinds of configurations like that. That becomes another, the third ground state wave function. And of course, the fourth one is that we start from this point and apply all the little plaquettes, and we generate a big superposition, and that is the fourth dimension of the ground state Hilbert space. Yes. Oh, yeah. Why two? Why not two? Yeah, good question. Okay, so let's see what happens with two. If we have two, we can start to put in little plaquettes and try to remove part of it, right? We can put in this plaquette and then remove this part and this part so then we open the ribbon in the middle, okay? And then we can keep doing that. We can, we can put in another plaquette like this and move the, the ribbon down and put another plaquette here, move the ribbon down. And in the end, you can finally see that by putting in little plaquettes, we can actually remove two string into no string at all which means that two string is actually something that's already here, okay, even though I didn't draw it. So there's actually already a configuration starting from the no string configuration that we can generate the two string configuration. And this one can actually be generated by just applying BP plaquettes one by one, just along the strip. So it actually only matters in the case of Tori code whether there's an even or odd number of big loops in a certain direction. If there's no loop, it's the same. It's equivalent to the case where there are two loops. Okay. And of course, the case where there's one loop is, is still a different thing. Yes. 
Uh -huh. no, okay, diagonal one is, is more like, like this. So, for example, we can have one that goes this way, right? But this one you can deform it. Uh, I should use blue, sorry. can move it around and deform it such that, uh, yeah, such that it just becomes this. Okay. They're equivalent to each other. It only matters how many times you wrap around the torus in the x and y direction. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, sorry, it was confusing. Uh, and when I, yes, when I drew this diagrams first, I was talking about open boundary conditions, but then I move on to talk about periodic boundary condition. I'm putting this extra term, which is confusing, sorry. What I meant is that all the previous configurations I drew still applies to periodic boundary conditions. So you can imagine that putting all these configurations on periodic boundary condition and then add this extra one. Yeah, sorry. So, so this is periodic boundary condition. Right. So, so Tauri code on a torus has ground state degeneracy four. Knowing this, knowing this, now I'm going to ask you a question. What is the ground state degeneracy if I put toric code on a sphere? It, it might sound like a, a bad question because I talk about toric code on a square lattice and it's not obvious how to put a square lattice on a, on a sphere. You probably need to involve some pentagons or triangles and things like that. Um, but Let's forget about the lattice for a moment because, you see, when I, when I do this discussion, I didn't even put the lattice in, right? Actually, this kind of story holds on whatever lattice. You can just imagine a manifold where there are loops floating around, okay? So just thinking in terms of the picture of loops and of, of these kind of big loops or small loops and try to argue what the ground state degeneracy should be if I put the model on a sphere. Okay, so, so a sphere would look something like this. And what do you think the answer is? What? Yes, because there are no big loops on a sphere, right? I can draw whatever loop like this and it can shrink to a point. Even if I take the, the, the equator, an equator can shrink to uh, either the south pole or the north pole. So a sphere doesn't have a non-trivial, non-contractable loop, meaning that if we put Tauri code on a sphere, the ground state degeneracy is just one, yeah. So you all got it. Non-degenerate. And actually, this kind of thinking applies to all kinds of manifolds, yes. Ah, oh, okay, why we don't have more? Yeah. Right, okay, good. Good question. So, well, for this kind of Hamiltonian, it's actually easy to argue why we exactly have four, okay? So the way to do it is to Think about how these terms, they, 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 they put constraint on the Hilbert space. Okay. So originally, we start from a bunch of qubits. 
right? And each qubit has a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And we have two spins per unit cell, so that's four-dimensional Hilbert space per unit cell. Right? So the dimension of the Hilbert space is two to the n of, uh, sorry, four to the n of vertices. Now let me do it over there. So dimension of total Hilbert space is four to the number of vertex, the number of vertices, uh, or the number of unit cells. And, and then we can see how this big Hilbert space gets cut down if we try to satisfy the A term and the B term. The A term and B term, they're poly operators and they're squaring to one, meaning that half of the Hilbert space has eigenvalue one and half of the Hilbert space has eigenvalue minus one. So if we try to satisfy one of the A term, we cut the Hilbert space into two. Right? And we try to satisfy another A term, we cut the Hilbert space into two. And if we try to satisfy the B term, we again cut the Hilbert space into two. And that just works similarly for all of the terms because they all commute. Okay. They all commute, meaning that cutting the first one doesn't affect the way you cut the second one. You just cut the Hilberts into two every time you enforce eigenvalue being one for each of the operators. Okay. So we just count how many operators there are uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, in the Hamiltonian, and then we'll get the ground state degeneracy. Right? So let's imagine we live um, a torus with periodic boundary condition, and let's see how many Hamiltonian terms we have. Well, we have one vertex term per unit cell and one plaquette term per unit cell. One vertex term per, per vertex and one plaquette term per vertex. Right? So that means we want to two Hamiltonian terms per unit cell, which means we want to divide this number by four to the number of unit cell. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not quite, right? Because not all the A terms are independent from each other, and not all the B terms are independent from each other. Okay. There are certain global constraints among them such that after cutting a certain number of times, the final 1A or final 1B is already fixed by all the previous ones, and you don't just have the freedom to, to cut anymore. Okay. And we can look for the constraint. And the constraint is such that if you multiply all the A terms, together, you get identity, right? Because every edge participates in two of the A terms. This edge participates in this vertex term and this vertex term, and the horizontal edge participates in the left vertex term and the right vertex term, right? So every edge participates twice. So you take tau z and you square it and you get identity, and you get identity everywhere, okay? So there's a constraint. There are actually exactly two constraints. That the product of all the AV terms is identity, and the product of all the BP terms is identity. Which is saying that we divide it by too much, right? We actually should divide this Hamiltonian constraint by a factor of four. So now this is very simple algebra, and you see that this is exactly equal to four. So we have a four-dimensional degenerate Hilbert space um, in a ground state. Okay, this is a great, great question, thank you. And actually, I'm going to follow your question. Because this is not the end. 
we've, we found that there's a full full ground state degeneracy, right? But how do you know that this is some degeneracy that we want to care about? And when I say what, whether we want to care about it, I mean whether this is a ground state degeneracy that's stable to local perturbation. Because in kinetic matter systems, kinetic matter systems are very dirty. There are lots of things that can happen that can deviate from the exact models like this. And in general, we, we should allow the possibility of having all kinds of local perturbations to the Hamiltonian. So the question now becomes, now we, ha we do have fourfold ground state degeneracy, but what if we add some extra terms, like tau z, tau x, whatever, to the Hamiltonian, making it ugly, not exactly solvable, but what if that can allow us to remove the ground state degeneracy, right? And actually, of course, this is not the case, because otherwise I won't be talking about this model here. The ground state degeneracy for Torico, this fourfold ground state degeneracy is stable to all local perturbations. And the way to see that is to realize how can we map between different ground states. Okay. And that actually can show us that in order to map from one ground state to another, we need to do something global and very, very long range and which becomes a, something that's not possible to do just by doing local perturbations. And you, you can immediately see what's going on if you want to map from one ground state to the other. You need to draw a big loop, right? If you want to map from this one to this one, you need to draw an uncontractable loop in the horizontal direction. If you want to map from this one to this one, you need to draw a loop in the vertical direction, okay? And that is something that's global that you need to do consistently along the loop to make sure that it does close up into a loop. And this is something that local perturbation simply cannot do, okay? And local perturbation cannot even tell whether there's a big loop in the horizontal direction or in the vertical direction. So more formally, we can write down what is called a logical operator. Of course, this is borrowing terminology from quantum information, but this is, a, this is a very useful terminology here. So a logical operator is one that allows us to map between different ground states. For example, one of the logical operators is one that draws a big string in the horizontal direction. It's a color, it doesn't look like red. Uh, let me find a different color. So what we do is to apply tau x operator all along the string, right? We apply tau x operator all along the string, we'll be able to map between this wave function and this wave function. And another logical operator is when we do it vertically. We apply a tau x operator along a vertical string and draw a vertical loop. And that gives us a second one. And the fact that these, these, these operations are very big, they have to cover the whole loop, tells us that um, the ground state degeneracy is stable to local perturbations. All right, good. So this is, uh, this is how much we want to know about the ground state wave function of Tauri code, okay? Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a civil position of all possible loop configurations and their de degeneracy. If you have big loops on the manifold, if you are living on a torus, or if you are living on even more complicated manifold with non-trivial genius, then you will have ground state degeneracy and you can map between the ground states by drawing big loops, by drawing big circles uh, on the manifold, okay? All right, now we want to talk about 
excitations. The ground state is boring. It's just uh, there. And um, at zero temperature, we have some degeneracy, but that's not the most exciting thing. The most exciting thing is the low energy excitations of the system. Now I need another square lattice. So bear with me when I draw another square lattice. Imagine how we can make excitations in the ground state. Suppose that the system is already in the ground state, satisfying all the A and B operators. And we want to take it out of the ground state so we can do something to it. And the simplest thing you can do to a spin model is to apply the tau z and tau x operator. Let's think about what happens if we apply, say, a tau x operator at a certain location in the system. What happens if I apply the tau x operator? Well, it's not the ground state anymore, right? Because the tau x operator changes the wave function, and it changes the eigenvalue of some of these Hamiltonian terms. It doesn't change the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian terms if the Hamiltonian terms are far away. If the Hamiltonian terms are here, it doesn't care about it. But if the Hamiltonian terms overlap with the operator that I apply, then the eigenvalue might be changed. And in particular, this vertex operator, this AV, and this vertex operator, AV, they anti-commute with the tau x operator I apply, right? So they get excited. Their eigenvalue change from 1 to minus 1, meaning that now, now, I, now I have a higher energy for the Hamiltonian, right? Just by applying this tau x operator, I change the energy of this one from I change the eigenvalue from 1 to minus 1, change the eigenvalue of this one from 1 to minus 1, so altogether I cost energy of 4 for this Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay. And uh, I can keep doing that. I can, I can keep applying the tau x operator. Just do it one lattice spacing down. And what happens is that, well, I flip back this AV term, right? This AV term, I anti-commute with it again, so its eigenvalue become, got back to one, but another one got flipped. And this AV got flipped. So I do tau x and tau x again, I create two excitations, and you can see that I create two A excitations, and I can move them further apart by just keep applying this tau x operator. For example, I can, I can even make, make them turn. I can do tau x again here, such that I move this excitation to this point, and I can keep moving Move it to here. So if I start from a point, create two excitations, and keep moving them, and what happens if I close it up into a circle? If I apply tau x in a full circle, what happens? Anyone? Yes, goes back to ground state. Because I keep moving them, moving them, moving them, and finally this AV overlaps with this AV, so they annihilate with each other. Okay. So this, this AV, this excitation of AV is actually what we call a fractional excitation. We create them in pairs, and once we create them in pairs, we can move one of them anywhere, we can move the other anywhere, and finally if we bring them back, the two annihilate with each other, and we go back to the ground state. And 
now we're actually going to make some connection to gauge theory because this AV, this violation of AV is something that I'm going to call a charge excitation. Okay, of course, charge is something that we, we talk about in gauge theory, right? Uh, we have electromagnetism and we have charge. So here, of course, I'm just introducing the terminology in a very brute force way, but I'm going to show you later uh, why this is a legitimate way to, to call it, why we think of it as charge, why it is actually related to the, to the actual charge, the electromagnetic charge that we usually talk about. All right. Um, good. So this is one. So applying a tau x string is one way to make fractional excitation. In particular, it's the charge excitation we're making. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question is, if I apply tau x, does it affect BP? Uh, it doesn't because it commutes with BP, right? So it commutes with BP, so, uh, uh, all right. So let me just write a few lines. So we start from ground state, and we apply tau x somewhere, and you can ask what happens to BP, right? And because they commute, so this is just tau x BP psi, which is tau x psi, meaning that uh, the wave function after the application of tau x is still an eigenstate of BP with eigenvalue 1. On the other hand, if we ask the question of the AV, which overlaps with the tau x, and because they anti-commute, so there's a minus sign coming out, which means that the wave function after the application of tau x is an eigenvalue minus 1 eigenstate of AV, meaning that AV is excited. Okay. Sorry? Uh, yes, good question. That's uh, the second step. Now we're going to play with tau z, right? Uh, should be the other side of the story. So let's apply tau z. Well, applying tau z using the same logic, it doesn't do anything to the A term because the A terms are made up of tau z and they all commute with tau z. But at the B term, the B term, they're made up of tau x, so they might anti-commute with the tau z if they have overlap. And here, if we apply the tau z here, it's going to anti-commute with the B operator in this plaquette and this plaquette. Okay, making two excitations. Okay. So again, it's a pair of excitation. And now we can move them around. We can move them around by applying tau z on the subsequent edges like that. And we can even make them turn. Such that we can move the two excitation apart. Okay. And very similar to the, to, the, to the tau x case, we create a pair of excitation, move them around, and finally we can bring them back. If we apply the operation to a full circle, we annihilate the two excitations, so we go back to the ground state. So, uh, so we'll call the violation of BP, we'll give it the name of flux excitation. And we'll see later why, why this is a good way of calling it. Okay. So
So the charge and flux excitation are the two basic type of excitations of toric code. We can actually get all the fractional excitation by starting from them and doing some composition. Let's give them some notations. Let's give, let's call this charge excitation, let's denote it by E. Well, that's the usual notation we give to charge. Right? And let's call the, the flux excitation uh, M. Okay. And we can ask what kind of quasi particles, what kind of excitations are these things? If we really think of them as point charges. And we can ask, are they bosons? Are they fermions? And do they have statistics with each other? And that's something that would make sense in a gauge theory. Right. Even though I haven't explained to you why this is called charge, why this is called flux, but if that connection is true, then we would be able to talk about whether, for example, the charge is a bosonic charge or fermionic charge. Right. And we can talk about the flux excitation in a two-dimensional case. We can talk about the statistics of the flux excitation as well. And we can talk about something which is what happens if we bring a charge around the flux. Right. Remember that this is what happens if we, when we do the aharonov bohm effect experiment. Now we have a we have a, a, a flux loop, sorry, we have, a <clears throat> we have some flux going through a hole and we put some electrons and the electrons go around the hole, right? go around the flux. And what happens in the, in the harnoff bohm effect is that the electrons go around the flux even though on the outside of the of the hole, the magnetic field is zero because magnetic field is only non-zero inside the hole. But the electron, it does feel the existence of the magnetic flux in such a way that the total flux through the middle will change the phase factor of the ground state wave function. Right. If you learn about the, the Aharonov bohm effect, that's the, the famous experiment which shows that, that electrons are actually quantum mechanical particles, that its wave function has a phase factor, and the phase factor can, can be changed by coupling to an electromagnetic field. It's coupled in such a way that even though the magnetic field itself is zero, it can, the phase factor can be changed by putting some flux through the trajectory of the electron. So this is what we expect to happen if we call something a charge and we call another thing a flux, that the charge going around the flux is going to accumulate some phase factor. So in the Aharonov bohm effect, of course, it's a real electric charge, a real magnetic flux, and, uh, and the electron going around the, the flux will accumulate a charge, uh, will accumulate a phase factor of e to the i phi times the charge, electric charge, and over h bar or something. And my, my, the, the, the unit here might not be accurate. I, I apologize. This might be some, some constants here. Um, but the point is that the phase factor times the electric charge, this is the real electric charge of the particle, changes the phase factor of the wave function. And that is exactly what we happen what we expect to happen here is that we have, a, we have some, some, some pseudo charge and we have some pseudo flux. We give them the name and we expect that they have certain pseudo statistics, pseudo phase factor induced when one of them goes around the other. So let's see how that happens before we take a break. So this is the two dimensional system, the lattice model that we were talking about. Okay, and uh, well, let's create some flux. Let's create some flux out of the vacuum, right? So what, how, the way we create a flux, of course, is by applying these tau z strings, and then we will have 
one flux at this end and one flux at the other end. So we do tau z, tau z, tau z all along the string. And we have one m particle here and one m particle here. Remember that these m particles, they literally correspond to uh, a BP operator with eigenvalue minus one. OK, so this is like cutting a hole in the system and putting some flux through the hole. Okay. And now what we want to do is to bring a charge and let it go around the hole. Okay. Well, the way we do that is by stretching out some tau x string. Okay. And with this tau x string, we're, we're creating two charges at the end. And we want to bring one around the flux and finally annihilate them. Okay. And, and when I draw this circle, what I mean is that I literally apply this tau x string all along the circle. Okay. And the thing we want to compare is between the case where there is a flux with the case where there is not a flux. Okay. We want to see how existence of this string changes what happens when we bring a charge around this particular point. Well, the only thing that, that can, can happen is when they intersect. Right? So imagine that let's zoom in to this point where there's a, a cross at this point, this is part of the, uh, the square lattice that we draw over there. Okay. So at this point, what happens is that when we created the M particle, what we did is we applied a tau z, uh, sorry, a tau z operator on this particular qubit. Right. And then when we brought, bring the, the E charge around, we applied another tau x operator at this location. Okay. And now there's a difference. If we first generate the flux, bring the charge around, compared to the case where we bring the charge around and then generate the flux, that corresponds to a commutation between these two operators. What is the commutation relation between the two operators, between the two strings? How do they commute with each other? So they anti-commute. Just because that they overlap at this particular location, and one of them act with tau x and the other acts with tau z. Right? So the different order of doing things, whether we create the flux first, bring the charger around, or bring the charger around and then create the flux, that differs by a minus one. And that is exactly the Hronov bohm effect in this particular case. And of course, in this case, uh, the flux cannot be arbitrary value. It is only minus one corresponding to uh, e to the i pi. Okay. So that's why we usually call this flux a pi flux. You have learned about superconductivity. That's the same pi flux we're talking about. OK. Um, OK, so this is the, 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 the Harnoff bohm effect. This is the mutual statistics between the charge excitation and the flux excitation. Uh, there's also something called uh, the cell statistics, which is concerned about whether uh, the, the charge and the flux are bosons or fermions or some, kind of, some other kind of anions. Uh, that can also be found. And that can be found in a way um, uh, that I will not explain too much, but just tell you we can find it. The way to find the self statistics is again uh, on the ground state. We want to use the string to do something, and the way we use the string to do something is to draw a figure of eight. We draw a figure of eight either with the tau x string and tau z string and see how that changes the ground state. 
And the answer is that it does not. And you can, you can simply do the computation yourself. You can do a figure of eight tau x string or tau z string, but because all the operators are just tau x and tau z, so they have no commutation with itself. So, so if we do this exercise with either the e, op, uh, e excitation or the m excitation, we're going to find that this is exactly equal to uh, the ground state itself, meaning that the topological spin of the E particle and the M particle are just one, so they are bosons. Okay. So I hope you can, these are the two conclusions that we reach um, by just looking at the lattice model, studies excitation and the, the string operator, how they commute with each other, how they commute with itself. And these are the two conclusions I want you to keep in mind. And later we're going to see how it actually is related to the idea of gauging, okay? One is that the E particle going around the M particle has a phase factor of minus one, or correspondingly the, the Hanoff form phase factor is pi. And the other one is that the charge and the flux, they're both bosons, okay? Okay, so uh, I guess we can take a 10 minute break and come back and then I'll show you how this can be understood in terms of starting from a much, much simpler uh, model and then gauge it into this gauge theory of Tory code.
Okay. All right. Welcome back. Okay. I got I got several very good questions during the break, so I just want to uh, address them um, with all of you together. Uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, they're very important points uh, before we move on. Uh, so one of the question is why um, the fact that we map from one ground state to the other using this big string operator implies that local perturbation cannot remove the degeneracy. Okay, so that's a very good question. And um, the reason is that um, let's say we have one ground state, which is uh, let's say energy. Let's shift the energy to zero. Okay, let's just shift the energy to zero, um, or some some, um, some some energy, just uh, energy minimum. And we have another ground state which is also at energy minimum. And we know that in order to map from one ground state to the other, the thing we need to do is to apply a string of tau x, right? And we need to apply a number of tau x that's as large as the system size in one direction, okay? And this is uh, one, okay? So you can ask, well, what happens if we just add the term of tau x to the Hamiltonian? So you can take the original Hamiltonian, which is exactly solvable. Now we add to it with some small coefficient, epsilon. The tau x term at every location, right? for every spin, we add a tau x term, so basically we're like, like adding a magnetic field to the spin model, okay? Of course, but this is a small magnetic field. Okay. And you can ask what happens to the degenerate growth space if we add this perturbation? But once we add this perturbation, the Hamiltonian is not exactly solvable anymore because this, this tau x term, it doesn't commute with the AV term, right? AV term involves a bunch of tau z, so they don't commute, so we cannot solve it exactly. But we can argue about things using perturbation theory. Right? And this is degenerate perturbation because these states, they are degenerate. And the way degenerate theory, uh, perturbation theory goes is that we can try to map from one ground state to the other using the term in the perturbation. Okay. For example, we can put one tau x in between psi one and psi two and try to see how it gives correction to the ground state energy, right? And it doesn't because a single tau x cannot connect psi one to psi two, so this term is actually zero. Right. And similarly, if you put two tau x it's still zero because there's no way you can connect psi one to psi two unless you put all the tau x along the string together and use it to do the perturbation theory. So there is indeed some correction to the energy, but that term comes in the form of the product of all the tau x between psi one and psi two along the string. Okay, so, so there are all of them. But remember that each of the tau x term comes with a coefficient of epsilon in the perturbed Hamiltonian, so there's, an phase, is a, there's a factor of epsilon to the lth power. So the whole thing goes as epsilon to the lth power. Okay. So there is indeed some changing energy. There's a tunneling between the ground states that's, that's induced by the perturbation to the Hamiltonian, but it's only on the order of epsilon to the lth power. Meaning that if we have a very, very big system, if we take the thermodynamic limit, then the energy splitting is exponentially small, which we can safely ignore. But if we don't have a very large system, if we only have a small system, then the energy difference can be big, right? Then we can actually, actually split the degeneracy. That's what happens if you have finite size effect in your numerics. You might not actually see the fourfold ground state degeneracy. You might actually only see, well, uh, 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 energy splitting between all the ground states. Only if you take the thermodynamic limit, make your system size big, do you see that the four states become closer and closer in energy and finally become 
degenerate. Uh, but, but their approach should be very fast because we're guaranteed that the, the energy splitting should get small in an exponential way. Okay, so that is the good news. Okay. Of course, for numerics, it still might be hard to see the degeneracy. Okay, the second question is, uh, so, so uh, it's regarding the, uh, the cell statistics and the figure of eight that I drew here, so I want to say a bit more about that because I, I did it in a very quick way. Um, okay, so, so I claim, of course I can't explain very clearly, but the way we want to look for the cell statistics of these excitations is by drawing the string operator in a figure of eight and then see how it changes the ground state wave function. Okay. For example, uh, if we want to do it for the E particle, what we can do is to draw a string operator like that, and it goes around and around in a figure of eight and crossing itself at this point, and then finally fuse back, right? And you can, you can home, do homework and see that if we just do tau x along the figure of eight, it doesn't change uh, the ground state wave function. On the other hand, if we do for the m excitation, that is, if we do it on these kind of edges with tau z operator, imagine that we apply tau z whenever the blue dotted line crosses the edges of the square lattice, and that is for calculation of the topological spin of the m particle. And homework again, you can show that um, this doesn't change the ground state wave function, it's again one. But there is an interesting case here, which is the composite of E and M particle. Okay. The composite of E and M particle, which we usually write it as um, uh, E cross M equals psi, and this is a fermion. This actually has to do with the fact that E and M particle has a mutual braiding statistics of minus one, so that this psi particle is a fermion. And you can literally check it yourself because, because psi is the combination of E and M, so the string operator of psi is just by applying tau x here and then tau z on some neighboring edges, okay? So the way we can calculate topological spin for the psi particle is by drawing the string of tau x and tau z together. Sorry, this is tau z. We do tau x and then tau z on the edges that's sticking out. So like this, tau x and tau z, and then tau x and tau z and tau z, and then moving above, we do tau x and tau z. So we go like that. Okay. We complete the figure of eight. And you can calculate it very explicitly that this gives rise to a minus sign if you apply the figure of eight for the doubled string operator uh, on the ground state wave function, implying that this psi particle is actually a fermion. Okay, so this is the fun thing you can, you can do uh, when you go home today. Okay. All right. Um, okay, any questions? No, good. So now we can move on and see why we, we are calling it a gauge theory and why we can think of the excitations as charge and flux. Uh, we're going to actually retreat back to a very, very simple model, the model that you learn in the first day of a condensed matter class, which is called the transverse field icing model. How many of you have seen the transverse field icing model? Okay, a larger proportion, good. <laughs> Uh, 
um, again, I'm going to do the transverse field icing model on the square lattice, just to match the discussion we had uh, on Tari code. Imagine that we have a square lattice, and we have icing spin sitting in the middle of each plaquette. We have icing spin sitting at the middle of each bouquet, which I'm going to label as sigma. Okay. So from now on, I'll be very careful with notation. So tau corresponds to the gauge field, and sigma corresponds to what we call the matter field. Okay. So again, this is a, a spin one half degrees of freedom. So we have sigma x and uh, sigma z. Sorry. Um, sorry. I think it's better if I put the, the sigma spin at the vertices. Sorry. Sorry about that. Let me put the, the sigma spin at the vertices. Okay. It's the same thing. It's just I'm, I'm shifting things around. But I put the sigma spins at the vertices, and we have sigma x and sigma z. Okay. And the transverse field icing model is one where we have uh, the interaction between the, the spins given by sigma x, sigma x on nearest neighbor sites together with another term in the z direction summed over all lattice site. This is transverse field icing model. Oh, I forgot to add some coefficient. This is with coupling J, and, uh, and, and let, me, let me just set this one to one. Okay. okay. Um, and you probably, if you learn about transverse field icing model, you know that there are two phases. One is the symmetry breaking phase, and the other is symmetric phase. Uh, but whatever, the most important thing about transverse field icing model is that there's a symmetry. And that symmetry is a global <laughs> symmetry. Right? And the symmetry is simply implemented by a unitary operation of the tensor product of all the sigma z operators. Right? You can see that uh, this transverse field, sorry, this, uh, this transverse field is symmetric under the symmetry, and also this icing coupling term is symmetric under the symmetry because even though sigma x anti-commute with the symmetry, we always have two of them. So it's a, it's a symmetric term. And, um, and uh, we all know that and there are two phases, one j is, um, much, much smaller than one, then this transverse field dominates, so we have a symmetric phase. And if J is much, much larger than one, then we have a symmetry breaking phase. So the symmetric phase, uh, in the simplest case, you can imagine where j is just equal to zero. Right. If j is equal to zero, we only have transverse field, and then the eigenstates is simply all the spins polarized in the z direction. All, all the spins in the state of zero, that gives, you, that gives us the lowest energy, and that becomes the, the ground state of the whole system. So it's a unique ground state, tensor product wave function, very simple, no entanglement at all. Uh, the simplest wave function you can think about. In the case of j much larger than one, they're actually, or we just set j to infinity and ignore the, the transverse field term, then there are actually two ground states. One is all the spins in the plus direction 
or all those things in the minus direction, right? in the positive or negative sigma x direction. So of course, all those things wants to point in the same direction to minimize energy here, but they can point either in the plus x direction or minus x direction. So each of these ground states violate the symmetry. That's why we call it a symmetry breaking phase. So I, I suppose this is a story that you're more or less familiar with. Yeah. OK, so, so what's the relation between this very simple model and the Tori code model we were talking about? That is, we're actually going to take the transverse field icing model and do something called couple to gauge the couple to gauge field. Couple the transverse field icing model to Z2 gauge field. such that it actually turns into the Tori code. Okay. So here the word gauge appear, and as I said at the beginning of the class, that whenever you see gauge, you replace it in your mind by the, the word local. Okay. So what we are trying to do when we say we want to gauge the symmetry or gauge the model, meaning that we want to turn the global symmetry into a local symmetry. Of course, right now, this is a global symmetry. We need to apply sigma z on all the lattice sites in the transverse field icing model in order for the Hamiltonian to be invariant. If we only apply it to a point, like here, if we only apply sigma z at this particular point, then some of the term is not going to be invariant. right? And those kind of terms involve the coupling term here, the coupling term here, the coupling term here, and the coupling term here in terms of sigma x and sigma x. All these four terms are going to get a minus sign if we only apply symmetry locally at sigma z. Okay. So without doing anything special, this model, this transverse field model is not locally symmetric. It has a global symmetry but doesn't have a local symmetry. And what we want to do is to promote the global symmetry into a local symmetry. And it turns out that something magical happens once we do that. And the thing we do, of course, we want to do something highly non-trivial in order to achieve that purpose. And the thing we do is to put in the gauge field, is that we put in these degrees of freedom in the Tori code, these tau fields. And we couple the tau field and uh, the sigma field in a certain way, such that the total model become locally symmetric. Okay. That is, we're actually going to have symmetry acting locally, acting near each lattice site, and the whole model is symmetric under each of the local symmetry transformation. So let's see how that goes. So what we're going to do is to put uh, the tau degrees of freedom on all the edges, connecting nearest neighbor sigma spins, just at the usual location where we did for the Tauri code model. Uh, I'm not sure if the color is clear. So the green dots are for the matter field and the white dots are for the, the gauge field. But the, the, the matter field lives at ver uh, lattice site, and um, uh, the, the gauge field lives at on the, on the edges. Thank you. <laughs> OK, good. That's helpful, yeah. This one's good. Um, right, so okay. So the way we want to do it 
is to take the matter field, take the gauge field, and couple them, right? And of course, we, we know what the problem is. And the problem is these sigma x, sigma x terms. These sigma x, sigma x terms, they're not locally symmetric, so we want to modify them. And we can modify them by inserting some tau operator such that on the local symmetry, the sigmas transform and the tau also transform and all together, their transformation cancel. Okay. So let me show you how that goes. Okay. So let's define what the local symmetry looks like. So local symmetry acts around the vertex and there's one matter field at each vertex and there are four gauge fields around the vertex. And we'll define the local symmetry operation as sigma z, which is originally how the symmetry wants to act on the matter field, and then tau z. Tau z on all the gauge field around it. You can see this is like putting the matter field at the center of the AV terms, by right. putting them together. Of course, uh, now we have made it a local symmetry. This is still a Z2 local symmetry, meaning that it squares into identity. Right. So if we started from a global symmetry that squares into identity, we want to still keep that property when we promote it into a local symmetry. So the local symmetry still squares into identity. The, the weird thing about this local symmetry is that each gauge field transforms under two local symmetry, right? Each gauge field transforms under local symmetry at, around this vertex and around that vertex. But that's what gauge field do. And that's why we want to introduce the gauge field. And the gauge field transforms under gauge symmetry at different spatial locations such that they can mediate the gauge interaction and we can make the model gauge symmetric. Okay. Without doing that, we, we, we cannot in general make a model gauge symmetric or locally symmetric. Okay, so this is uh, local symmetry. Okay. So the, now we have defined what the local symmetry looks like. Our next step is to make the model locally symmetric. Okay, we just take the model and we want to write down all the terms in a locally symmetric way. Okay. What, do we do, what do we have to do about this term in order to make it locally symmetric? Do we have to do anything? No, it's already locally symmetric, right? It commutes with all the uh, local symmetry actions, so we just keep it. We do nothing and um, and that term, we just copy them into the gauge model. But we have to do something here, right? Because this term, originally, it's not symmetric under these kind of local actions because one of the sigma x is going to anti-commute with the sigma z and, and it's not invariant. So what, what can we do in order to make this term locally symmetric. Anyone? Yes, exactly. We can insert a tau x in between such that the tau x say, sitting here is going to anti-commute with the tau z in the local symmetry action and all together they commute. So sigma x i tau x ij, meaning that this tau field sits in between uh, the nearest neighbor sigmas. And like that. Okay. And we sum over the ij terms. So this is the way 
now we can make globally symmetric terms locally symmetric. And actually, it's not just restricted to nearest neighbor coupling terms. Let's say we add a coupling term that's diagonal on the square lattice. Sigma x, sigma x. This is, again, a symmetric term, right? It's symmetric on the global symmetry. And we want to make it locally symmetric. We want to make it symmetric under all the local symmetry actions at the vertices. What can we do? Maybe it's easier if I make it horizontal. Let's not make a turn. Let's just do here. If we have two sigma x coupled in that way, how can we make it locally symmetric? Yes, exactly. We, we take two tau fields. in the middle, okay? And you can check that it's locally symmetric under symmetry at this vertex, at this vertex, and at this vertex, right? Under all of the local symmetry actions. So the claim is that when you introduce a gauge field like that and define your local symmetry like this, any global symmetric terms, any term that's symmetric under the original global symmetry can be made locally symmetric by coupling into them some of the, some of the gauge field along the way. Okay, I cannot prove that, well, I can more or less prove that because, because these longer distance coupling term, they can be obtained by composing nearest neighbor coupling terms. You just have sigma x, sigma x, tensor sigma x, sigma x, and the middle one cancel and becomes a longer term coupling term. So if we can make the local ones locally symmetric, then we can make a longer distance one locally symmetric as well. Yes. But they don't have, they're independent operators. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so this is the local symmetry. Maybe that's the thing that was not clear. This is the local symmetry action at each vertex, around each vertex. It involves one sigma z and four tau z. The tensor product of the five gives you the local symmetry action. So you can check that if you only have this term, it's not going to commute with all of these kind of local symmetries. Only if you make it into sigma x, tau x, sigma x, does it commute with everything. Yes? Right. Okay, so the question is, um, for example, if we have sigma x, sigma x coupled diagonally, we can choose different paths to put the tau, right? We can put tau along this, uh, this path or we can put tau along this path. Um, that's a good question, I cannot address it now, but later we can see that this is actually equivalent if enforced the zero flux condition. Uh, this is something I'm going to come to, I don't know, <laughs> in five minutes, hopefully. But that's a great point. Um, Okay, so, so, so the claim is that as long as we have a globally symmetric Hamiltonian, by putting in these gauge field, we can make them locally symmetric on the local symmetry action that looks like this. Yes? Yeah, right. Um, yes, good question. Um, okay. So <laughs> the reason is that if you do that, then something magical happens. For example, it, you, it, you can, there, there can be emergent topological order. And um, of course, the, the original reason is that people find that nature works in this way, that 
standard model is made up of gauge theories for whatever reason, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, nature is, uh, all, the, all the couplings, strong weak electromagnetic couplings, they're generated by gauge field. So it's not, um, it's not why we want to do it, it's like, it's just that. <laughs> and the inclined matter is more about coupling to a gauge field so that emergent topological order can come out. And this actually becomes a very useful way to identify what is the order in the symmetric model itself. For example, if we are in a, in a symmetric phase or in a symmetry breaking phase and you gauge it, you're actually going to get different result, uh, which is something I'm going to talk about tomorrow. I don't think I'll have time today, but, but we can very explicitly see that starting from different phases under global symmetry, we end up with different gauge theory phases. Okay, so uh, where am I? Oh, okay, right, so, so, so now we, we made um, the matter field, all the terms in the matter field Hamiltonian locally symmetric, right? This is good, uh, but this, this is not the end of the story because now we have introduced a lot of gauge field, but we still have the same number of Hamiltonian terms, which means we'll have a lot of degeneracy in the system. So we, we need to actually talk about what happens to the gauge field themselves. If the gauge field, we just let them be, then and there's too much degeneracy going on, okay? But what happens to the gauge field is that we want to impose a condition that the flux around a plaquette is zero, okay? So this is a condition that's consistent with the local symmetry. So we want to add to this, actually, the BP terms. And the BP terms here is pure gauge term. Okay. So it's a tensor product of four tau x around the plaquette. And we're going to interpret that as the zero flux condition. Of course, in the, in the continuum, if you take the continuum limit, it just means that there's no magnetic field, zero magnetic field, because magnetic field costs energy, so we don't want magnetic field. Okay, in, in the discrete case, uh, we just impose the zero flux condition on every plaquette. And that's it, this is our gauged Hamiltonian. Gauged. This is the original one, this is the gauge one. Okay. The gauge one involves all the original terms made locally symmetric and, all the, and, and also uh, the flux term. Okay. Sorry? Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, thank you. That is a good point because that's something I'm going to uh, use. So there's a J here, right? Okay, and now is the moment of truth. We're going to see that why taking this transverse field icing model, couple it to the gauge field into a gauge version of the model is related to the Tori code. Okay. Yes. We, if we don't uh, impose the BP term, yeah. it'll be too much degeneracy. Um, so these degeneracy, they can be removed by local terms like BP. So if you have a lot of degeneracy that's removable by local perturbation, it's generally bad. Yeah. So we want to put in something that remove the degeneracy in the gauge field, but also retain the local symmetry. And BP turns out to be the simplest term that does that. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Oh, 
Oh, uh, yeah, right. So these, uh, this is a Z2 symmetry, so it's a Z2 charge, so it's either zero or one. Yes. There's no integer labeled charge. Um, it's either even or odd. If it's odd, then it's coupled. If it's even, it's not coupled. Yeah, that's true. Yes. And we're going to see. We're going to see. Okay. Yeah, so now the question becomes, how do we solve this Hamiltonian, right? Um, this, in principle, is doable, at least in the limit where j is very large or j is very small. Because if j is very large or j is very small, we ignore either of the term, this thing becomes commuting Hamiltonian again. Because the BP term, the BP term, they commute with themselves, and they commute with the local symmetry constraint, and they also commute with these things. Oh, no, sorry. Mm. Oh, yes, the, the BP term also commute with, uh, with, with any of uh, these gauged terms that come from the original Hamiltonian. So, so let's see one of the limit. In the limit where j is equal to zero, when j is equal to zero, well, the original Hamiltonian is very simple, right? The original Hamiltonian is just transverse field, so we know that the, the, uh, the ground state doesn't break the symmetry. There's a unique ground state which is pointing, everything pointing in the z direction. And let's see what happens to the, to the gauge Hamiltonian if we set j equal to zero. So if we set j equal to zero, the gauge Hamiltonian involves the transverse field and then also the BP term. Right. It still looks a bit complicated because there are all these gauge constraints, there's gauge field, there's matter field. Well, what if we can get rid of the matter field? And indeed, under this gauge constraint, a single sigma z is equivalent to the product of four tau z. So we can just replace the sigma z by the product of tau z, which is actually the AV term that we had before. But of course, we have used the, the condition that we kept the local symmetry. We enforce the local symmetry such that we can integrate out the matter field in a sense. We get rid of the matter field so that we get a pure gauge theory with only the AV term and the BP term, which is exactly a toric code Hamiltonian. Right, because we have this local symmetry and we enforce the local symmetry to be unbreakable. So this is just the constraint on the Hilbert space that we consider. Everything has to be eigenvalue one under all these local symmetry. And it's possible because all the local symmetry commute with each other. That's, that's the sector of Hilbert space that we'll be looking at. We don't want to consider sectors where gauge symmetry is broken. And then, uh, in that case, then sigma z becomes equivalent to the product of tau z, and we can just do the replacement. Okay. So, just as a conclusion, we see that we started from the symmetric phase of transverse field Ising model with global Z2 symmetry, and what we did is to gauge it, or more explicitly, we couple to Z2 gauge field such that the model becomes locally symmetric. And what we get is toric code with 
topological order. And one last thing I want to point out before we end the lecture today is why the charge is boson. Why the charge excitation is a boson in Tauri code. So you can see where the charge excitation come from, right? Charge excitation, which is violating the product of, of, of tau z around the vertex, is equivalent to violating a single sigma z at the lattice point, right? Because we enforce the gauge symmetry, so they're equivalent. So, so the charge excitation, if you interpret that in terms of matter field, that's just violating a single sigma z. That's just flipping a spin. And flipping a spin is a bosonic excitation. There's nothing fermionic to it. It's a spin model, so we don't really have a fermion excitation. So all the charge, the symmetry charge, because flipping a spin changes the symmetry charge, right? Changes the symmetry charge from one to minus one or minus one to one. And that is a bosonic excitation. And that's exactly what you see when you use the string operator for the, for the E excitation and do this figure of eight, you get one, and you should get one. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to continue the discussion by putting uh, J very large and ignore this term, and we're going to see what happens when we're in that limit. Okay, thank you.